not all of it so deep as to require traditional collieries to mine it. More than 10% of the nation's coal is won by the National Coal Board's open cast executive. 14.7 million tons in the year 1982 to 3. And here is one of the Coal Board's largest sites, Meadowgate. Worked between 1976 and 1982, it has produced a total of more than one and a half million tons of high quality coal and has been transformed in the process into the Rother Valley Country Park. The site of a total acreage of some 907 is bounded on the western side by now closed railway lines. At its southern end lies Killamarsh. Before open cast working started, the land was used for rough grazing. At its southern end, there was a small nature reserve. It was a scene of considerable dereliction, some of it caused by underground coal working in the past. A cottage on the eastern edge of the site was to be converted into staff accommodation once the park has been completed. Bedgrave Mill, too, almost in the center of the site, was to remain and to become the future park's visitor's centre. The old railway embankment with its bridge over the River Rother once served the nearby Norwood Colliery, now closed. The river was grossly polluted, frequently with an offensive appearance and smell. It was incapable of supporting fish life. But there was coal, lots of it. The National Coal Board were ready to mine it. In the 1960s, Sheffield City Council planned to build a new overspill area not far from Killamarsh. The creation of recreation facilities, sparse in any case to the east of the city, was considered at the same time. Having to provide additional flood water storage capacity in the valley because of the new housing, a large lake for water sports could be created at the same time. The idea of the Rother Valley Country Park was born. In the summer of 1976, a hot and long one as it turned out, work could begin. The first task at any open cast site is to establish an access road from a surrounding highway. Before the large excavation plant and machinery used in modern open casting could be deployed, the site had to be properly fenced and prepared. When the site was officially handed over to the successful contractor, Lehane Mackenzie and Shand Limited, a site meeting was held at which local farmers, landowners and residents could meet planners, local authority officials, contractors and coal board engineers. Although in essence the working of an open cast site follows a regular pattern, strip topsoil and store, strip subsoil and store separately, and then remove the overburden to reach the coal, each site offers its own special problems. Here, at all times throughout the operations, the valley had to continue to be available for flood water storage. Almost the first job during the long and almost tropical summer was to prepare for the diversion of the river under which much of the coal lay. Near the railway embankment on the western edge of the site, the topsoil was stripped and moved to be stored followed by the subsoil. A new bed for the soon-to-be-diverted river was being prepared. Temporary bridges were built across the river, still on its original course, so that heavy plant could progress from one side to the other, to where the soil dumps are, without leaving the site boundary. At the northern end, the overburden was moved, the strata that lie between the subsoil and the coal. By the time the board's contractors left the site, 23 million tons of overburden were stripped, moved, stored and replaced. Soon, under what was to become the course of the temporarily diverted river, the first coal was breached. In tight, compacted bands, 
the coal had to be scored and loosened by a ripper with claws to make loading possible. This is old mining country. The site was surrounded by collieries, old and new. Some closed due to exhaustion, others with a long and active life still ahead. The high hazel seam outcropped hereabouts. During the 1926 general strike, local miners dug their coal here. Killamarsh was once a mining village. Chatting under the cross in the churchyard of the parish church of St. Giles and the Cross, for centuries the village's meeting place were John Whitfield and German Haslam, both ex-miners. The site was bisected by a bund along the line of the old mineral railway embankment. It demarcated the line between the northern and southern areas of the site. The valley is part of the washlands storing water from the river Rother in spate to prevent flooding of the river Don. During the whole operation, it had to continue its function as a flood plain. At all times, the site has to be capable of storing nearly one million cubic meters of water. The new housing